because you have it disabled. So anyway, as I was saying, the um, I've spoken last two times I've spoken. I've spoken about Peter, and um, so the first time I spoke, I, I just spoke about I followed kind of Rainier's idea of doing uh, a, a, a character and and Jesus, and um, so. There you go. Here, let me quickly share my screen and start my presentation. There we go. Are we good? How's it look, Colin? Good? All right. Excellent. So, um, the, Peter and the Holy Spirit. I'm following that in that thing. Uh, so, we did Peter and Jesus, and then we did the restoration of Peter, and now we're going to finish off with Peter and the rest uh, and, and the Holy Spirit. It's actually Peter's Pentecost proclamation, um, and so what we have is we're going to take a brief look at Peter's rest of Peter's life, and which we really don't have a whole lot of information about. So I'm going to quickly breeze over that. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll look specifically at this all-important sermon that Peter did at Pentecost. So uh, I want to start by asking you a question, make you have, asking you to think back. Do you remember when you first became a Christian? When you repented and you asked Jesus to save you? The, the charge the change that took place within your heart and within your life, the enthusiasm, that, that passion. Um, I don't know about you, but I was just telling everyone about Jesus. It was so exciting. Uh, I, it was like I was woken up, and I knew, I had, I knew the story that you know, um, Plato talked about, the uh, philosopher Plato talks about looking in the back of a cave and, and living your life, looking at the back of a cave, and then turning around and being enlightened and seeing there's an opening. There's a whole different world. And to me, that's what becoming a Christian was like, is you, you saw the world for the first time for real, for what it was like. Um, and that's the excitement that's happening here in Pentecost. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we, we go through and we're going to double back. Um, so Peter... Peter struggled and stumbled as we talked about in his relationship with Jesus. And today, Peter and the Holy Spirit, we're talking about with this, my third uh, in this series. And, and they're so spread out that I'm going to have to do some, some review, some quick review. So let me, let me do this with this map. So just say that Peter, we know, was born in Bethsaida, up there north of the Sea of Galilee. So at some point, their family moved down to Capernaum, and we know he, he and his brother had a fishing business on the, on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we know that Peter was married, according to Luke, and based on Clement and Alexandria's writing, he also had children. Um, and then we also know, based on Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians, that um, he would occasionally take his wife with him as he went and he ministered to the, the churches. And so Peter, having grown up in this fishing community, grew up as a gruff, impetuous, um, strong, uh, brawling. I don't know if you ever guys have seen that this great series called um, the uh, the Chosen, but they show Peter before meeting Christ as a brawler. He was he's in a fight, and they're trying they're gambling for money, trying to make money by fighting. And I can totally see Peter doing something like that. That was the kind of guy he was, you know. Um, so that was Peter's character. He's impetuous, abrasive, bold, brash, enthusiastic, and full of energy. Uh, he had some amazing highs in his life, and he has had terrible lows. And ultimately, uh, we see that he, he ends up denying Christ three times, right? When, when Christ is being tried, and he's followed Christ Jesus to the to his trial area and people are saying hey you were with him he's no I wasn't and he vehemently 
denies Jesus three times. And we even did the top 10 failures of Peter. Can you imagine being someone who forever in the Bible, your, your failures are all just laid out for everyone to see. And that's Peter. Bold, brash, jumps out, uh, sticks his foot in his mouth multiple times. One case where he went from an extreme high to a low was when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter very boldly says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, says, you are right. It's on this profession that I'm going to build my church. He says, you are Peter, little rock. It's on this rock, this big rock, I'm going to build my church. And that's what we see happen at Pentecost as he starts to build his church. And he uses Peter as a first figure to do that. But you know what? It wasn't but a chapter later, or a few verses later, we can say, that Peter that P- Peter goes against what Jesus wishes. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to be delivered up. And Peter says, this is not going to happen. There's no way. And um, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Can you imagine just a you know, half an hour earlier, he says, God has spoken to you and given you this message. And now he's saying, get behind me, Satan. And then, and then it's um, later in Matthew 27, where he denies Christ three times. And he goes into this, this pit of despair because he knows he's denied the only Lord, the only living God. And he's totally denied the guy. And he knows it. And he goes into this despair. Um, And I believe that when when they're up at Galilee waiting for Jesus and and he says, I'm going to go fishing. I really believe John said, I'm going to go fishing with you because I don't want you out in that water by yourself. Not in the condition you're in right now. I really think that was part of it. So the that was my first sermon that I was talking about that. Second sermon, I talked about the restoration of Peter, how Jesus asks Peter three times, which kind of matches the three denials, says, do you love me? And he gives him a charge, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, take care of my followers. And then he tells his disciples, um, he teaches some more, and then he, eventually he tells the apostles and his disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the promised one. And that's where we are today. And I want to start like a quick overview to finish off kind of Peter's life. And then I'll go back to his sermon uh, at Pentecost. So just very quickly, um, if you will focus your attention on the Caesarea area down here, uh, Jerusalem, Caesarea, that's where we are, and Peter's in, in Jerusalem, and this is where they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, bang, and, and cr- causes this huge crowd to, to gather, and how does he do that? He, he, uh, the Holy Spirit comes with a rushing wind, with, with fire, um, and everyone, they start speaking in tongues and languages, and this huge crowd gathers. And then Peter preaches at Pentecost. He preaches. The church begins with 3,000 souls become believers, followers of Jesus. And then again, at the Temple Mount, they're heading up the Temple Mount. There's a, there's a crippled man. And um, so he, he, he heals this crippled man. A huge crowd gathers. Peter preaches. And 5,000 souls get saved and added to the church. And Peter's arrested. And and, and on and on and on. And so God is using Peter to really lay the foundation of the beginning of this thing that's called the church. Even to the point where Peter rebukes 
uh, uh, husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, for lying to the Holy Spirit. And boom, they drop dead because they've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then it says they feared. It says that the crowds feared the power that was going on here. But it says multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Never, don't be afraid of the strength and the power of God. And don't be afraid to be strong. Because people are, are, will be brought in no matter, you know, how, how strong. Don't, you know, some people want to say, oh, God just loves you and he'll accept you. But God is more than that. You know, Ananias and Sapphira, dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And so be strong about the gospel. Okay, so Peter pre continues chapter 5 of Acts. He, he preaches. He's told not to preach. He says, who are we going to obey, God or man? People continue to come. And then he moves on to this place in Samaria, Sebaste. I'm not even sure how to say it. S-A-B-A-S-T. You see it uh, there. Uh, he goes up there. He heals uh, someone who's been bedridden for eight years. But he also, uh, from there, he's called to Joppa, where he raises Dorcas, who's been dead. And he raises her up from the dead. Now, though, that's just kind of a road to get us to this point, because right now, the second most significant thing in the life of the church happens at this point. In chapter 10 you'll, of Acts, you see that Peter has raised Dorcas, and now he's on the rooftop, and he's praying, and he sees this, this vision and a tablecloth with animal, all kinds of unclean animals on it comes down. And God tells him to rise, slaughter the animals, and eat. And he says, no, I don't eat unclean things. It is wrong. And God says, what I have made clean is clean indeed. And he goes through this three times. Peter has this thing about having to hear something three times before it sinks in. And even then, when it's finished, he's still wondering, what is this all about? Well, at the same time, up in Caesarea, you see where Caesarea is. Up in Caesarea, there's a centurion called Cornelius who has a vision. And he's, he's praying, and he wants nothing more than to, to worship God, but he's not Jewish. And so he's worshiping the God of the Jews, but because he's not Jewish, he's not accepted into worship at the temple. Um, and he sees a vision. He says, send for Peter in Bring Peter here. He's in Joppa. And so what's interesting is that when Peter is pondering about what ha what's happening with this vision, and then he sees these people coming, and they say, Peter, we need you to come to Caesarea. And it's only then when Peter catches on, ah, this is what it's about, the Gentiles. So he goes to this Gentile, uh, this, this centurion, Cornelius. Cornelius receives God's receives the message, becomes a follower, accepts, I mean, receives the Holy Spirit, he, and he gets baptized. And now this gospel that was only for the Jews is now for the Gentiles also. But it's not a surprise because it's, it's been for the whole world ever since the prophecy way back with Abraham, right? A descendant will bless the whole world. Um, and so... Peter goes back to Jerusalem in, in chapter 11 and announces, hey, the, this guy is becoming a believer. He's not a Gentile. Um, and a lot of, a lot of the, the, the Christians rejoice, but the more conservative Hebraic Jewish believers, believers, it says, um, have a major problem with, with Peter eating with an uncircumcised Gentile. Um, and it's interesting, it doesn't say they, they have a problem with their, con their conversion, they have a problem with their eating with uncircumcised Gentile, which is, continues to be a problem that becomes, continues to be a debate within the church. Should 
Gentiles become circumcised when they become believers in Jesus Christ? Do they need to follow the Jewish regulations and the rules in order to truly be a follower of God? Well, in chapter 15, there's what we call the Jerusalem Council, where uh, they come together, the apostles come together to figure out this very problem. Uh, and, and they conclude that Jewish believers should not insist that Gentiles who have become believers in Jesus must adopt all the Jewish religious traditions. And so that's the, the Jewish council. Now, it's at this Jewish council where Peter kind of fades into the background and James steps up in the leadership of the Jewish church. And it was at this point where, where Peter disappears from the Acts narrative, to, uh, and, and Paul becomes a central figure in Acts. We, only, we hear about Peter three more times, um, two from Paul. Once in Galatians, where he's up in Antioch, and in Antioch, uh, even though Peter did this, with the, with the Gentile and led him to the Lord and witnessed it. In Antioch, Peter was influenced by the Hebraic uh, Jewish conservative sect, and he, he, he backs off from eating with Gentiles, and Paul faces him down and says, that's wrong. You can't do that. Um, you, you are uh, you're adding burdens to people who know Jesus, and that's not acceptable. And then Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians, um, he's talking about the Corinth church over here. And he said that there are some of you who say you're of Peter. Some of you say you are of Paul. So this is a direct reference to what Peter's doing. But what it says is that Peter was in Cor Corinth, and he was a teacher there at one time. And people are followers of saying they're followers of T Peter's teaching. And so... The final thing we see is that Peter wrote first and second Peter, right? And so in first Peter, he writes to the churches of Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So this area, which is now modern day Turkey, Peter writes both first and second Peter to those, the churches in those areas. And so he, we, 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 take from that surmise that he had an active ministry in that in those areas second peter is written about 67 AD and peter again is is in rome over in rome and he knows he's about to die second peter is his his last letter um, and he knows he's going to die so there's an importance placed on people's last will and testament. This is Peter's, in a sense, last will and testament. This is what he, he knows he's going to die. He's going to be taken out and killed. And this is the last thing he wants to say. So second Peter, key to that. And sure enough, not too long after this, church tradition has it that Peter was crucified in Rome and complaining and not wanting to be crucified as Jesus was crucified. The Romans said, fine, we'll crucify you upside down. And so they crucified him upside down. Now, there's a quick summary of Peter's life. We don't know too much about it. Most of what we know is through tradition and, and, and uh, historical writings of people who are writing based on tradition. Now we're to Pentecost. Let's go back to Pentecost. I stole this little graphic from the Bible Project. Because I really liked how they talked about and explained what was going on at Pentecost. What's up with these little tongues of fire that settle on everyone's head? That's an odd thing, an odd picture to have in your head. Um, well, what's going on here is Peter is, or sorry, Luke, who wrote Acts, Luke is drawing the comparison. And he's saying that we used to worship at the temple. And the pre presence of the spirit at the temple was always exemplified by fire. Fire and smoke. Uh, remember uh, the Exodus, you had the fire and smoke uh, that would lead them through the desert. Um, 
So God's presence is always represented by fire. And the rushing wind is, is also the representative of God's spirit. And so what, what's going on here is that the, uh, Luke is drawing and showing that God is, we no longer worship at the temple. Remember when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and, and she, she talked about where to worship. And Jesus says, um, that woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. See, what Luke is doing, he's showing that the temple is no longer where you worship God. It's us. We are being built up as a temple of God. 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 19 says, You, do you not know that you, uh, your body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You see, Luke again is saying, you're the temple, the church, the true church, those who, who follow Jesus, who have the Holy Spirit, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God. God dwells on this earth, not in a temple, but in you. And that's the point of Pentecost, is that God has now come down to dwell in people. They, they've been waiting for 10 days for this, and boom, it hits them super strong. So let's, let's quickly read. So for, uh, actually, let me, let me back up, give the, what's going on. The people are saying, wait a minute, these guys are drunk, right? You got some people saying, we hear them in all our different languages, praise God. And then the, there's another group saying, wait a minute, these guys are drunk. They're, they're causing a ruckus. Um, to which Peter says, wait, this isn't right. So he stands up. He says, these people are not drunk, as you would think, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Interesting, he didn't say, because they don't drink. He didn't say anything like that. He says, they're not drunk, because it's too early in the morning to be drunk. He says, but this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. So he's going back to the prophet, and he's saying that the prophets back this up. He says, but this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be that God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And what's prophesying? Prophesying is telling God's story. Prophesying is declaring God's word. It's declaring God's ways. And your young men shall see visions. And we, we, you see that, right? That's happened in the... Scripture is happening even today when how God reaches out into the different communities who don't know him, who don't have a witness. Uh, and people will say, how come you sought out Jesus? Well, because I had this dream. How come you sought out Jesus? Because I, I saw this um, and I had to. And so there's story after story of, of Muslims and people in, in countries that uh, don't have an active witness having visions and coming to the Lord. It's all about Jesus, as Peter's going to make the point. So it says, even on my male servants and female servants. So what's the point there? Why did he mention that? Well, what Joel is saying is that our society now, back in Joel's time, is very stratified. But you know what? They had a, they had a place, Gentiles had to be outside. The Jewish quarter could be here. And then the high priests, I mean, the priests and the high priests. And so you had a very stratified religion. Well, what Joel is saying and what Peter's making the point and what the Holy Spirit is doing, we're all the same. We're all equal. We all have this relationship that we can have with Jesus Christ through the Spirit. And it says, in those days, in these days, uh, I will pour out my Spirit and they will prophesy. That's what we're saying right here is people are worshiping and praising God you in, in languages and it's they're prophesying, they're they're preaching, 
Peter is standing up and preaching. He says, I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. What happened when Jesus died? Darkness. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, a great magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, everyone will be saved, not just the Jewish uh, people, but everyone. Peter first here explains the significance of the Holy Spirit, beginning with a prophecy from Joel. Peter states that the presence of of the Spirit and the apostles at that moment is what Joel predicted. In short, it is proof that this new covenant has begun, that the church is upon us, that the last days, which he mentions later, is here. There are several other texts in the Old Testament. We just talked about Joel, but there's like there's Isaiah 32 and Isaiah 30, 44 and Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel 37. You can look those up later. Um, and uh, they talk about this day, this coming day. Paul, uh, Peter continues. He says, men of Israel. Now he's, he's addressing the whole crowd. He says, all of you. So he was addressing those who ha were, had their doubts, right? He's saying, no, this is Joel. This is what Joel said would happen. Now he's addressing everyone. He's preaching them. It says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. <clears throat> There's a lot there. There's a lot there. Men of Israel, see, Jesus of Nazareth, he, Jesus was born a man. He was attested to be also of, by God through works and wonders and signs to be also of God. He, and he, he did these, God did these through Jesus amongst them, and some of them, are actually there. People who had seen these miracles that Jesus did were there in the crowd. And Peter says, despite seeing that, despite the power and the miracles that this man, Jesus, did through God, uh, with God and God did through him, sorry, uh, you crucified him, you killed him. But God wasn't done. God raised him up. He defeated death. Praise God. Now, Peter explains that Jesus was filled, fulfilled the purpose of God in his death and, 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 and was vindicated by his resurrection. So if he died and just stayed dead, people would say, ah, another fly-by-night uh, preacher. But he died and he was raised again to show that, no, this is real. Now, the life of Jesus uh, can be summarized like this. Jesus was born in Nazareth. And God attested to his uh, godness. He died and was raised again. Now, he did many signs. The word for signs... In Greek is Samoan, 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 well, I don't know, something like that. Samoan, uh, Samoan, I think is how you say. Um, and that's the word that's talking about. Now you got the wonders, and the, and the wonders are like from heaven, things that are happening in heaven, uh, and miracles are happening, and, and then his signs. Signs are, th are typically the signs mm -hmm. refers to a miracle which is done to prove a point to make some sort of revelation so peter states that god did these miracles through jesus interesting that not jesus himself did the miracles but god did them through jesus he adds uh, um, 
he adds that, he says, as you yourself know, because they were there, they saw the miracles, like I said before. Um, and so they saw the miracles that they crucified him. And so he's going to uh, appeal to the crowd again. He talks, he says, now, David, we talked about Joel. David, the one that you hold up as the king of kings, said this. I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Now, this is from Psalms, and they would very well know this, because this is one of the Psalms that they used to exalt David. This, and they, they thought this was David speaking this of himself. I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your holy ones be cor see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will always be uh, make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter says this, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he's both died and was buried and his tomb is with us even to this day. What's he saying? Well, in the psalm is saying he, that the Holy One will not see corruption. The Holy One will basically not deteriorate. And he continues, he, he explains it here. He says, being therefore a prophet, because David was the prophet king, right? He brought, uh, uh, he was a, a picture of Jesus. He says, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and he spoke about this resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. See, Jesus was raised from the dead. He did not see corruption. He was not abandoned to Hades, as the psalm talks about. It's not David. It's David's descendant, Jesus. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit that he has poured this out that you yourselves, this is what you are seeing and hearing. This tongues, the wind, this is what this is all about. It's about Jesus doing his work, Jesus dying. That You killed him, but it was God's plan for him to die, for him to be buried, and for him to be raised again, so that this very thing, what you're seeing today, can happen. The Holy Spirit can come. And we can launch the church. For David did not ascend into he the heavens, but he himself he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, who's him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. So let me quickly uh, wrap this up. Peter says, these guys aren't drunk. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit. They're proclaiming God's goodness, God's awesomeness. Just, just what Joel, he appeals to the Old Testament, to the prophet Joel. Then he declares uh, who Jesus is, and then he appeals to King David, who Jesus was a descendant of, who had to die and, and had to uh, be raised from the dead so that the Holy Spirit could come. Now, what was the response of the crowd? It says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. We've done wrong. We are going the wrong way. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? When Jesus, when God convicts you, 
of your life, we turn and we say, what can we do, God? What can we do? And Peter says this, a very simple uh, response. Repent and be baptized. Mm -hmm. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, got to unpack that because there's been a lot of confusion about that. Repentance is turning. Okay, what Peter's saying is that he's not saying you sinned yesterday, repent from that sin. No, what he's saying is that you've been going in a direction that's been focused on you. Your life is about you, your success. Your life is about your happiness. Your life is about everything else but what it should be about. It should be about God. Repent. Turn from yourself. Turn to God. Repentance is that turning. It's that complete surrender to God. When I first became a Christian, I said, Lord, anything, anything you want me to do, just take me. I will follow. That is the heart that God wants. That's repentance. That's turning from yourself and turning to him. It says, and be baptized. There's, there's a lot of people says you have to be baptized to be a Christian. Well, uh, if that's so, then I feel for the uh, thief on the cross who Jesus says, you will join me. And he wasn't baptized. Um, baptism, though, is super important. Baptism back in those days was that sign that you have committed your life and, been, and you've repented and you've become a Christian. See, today, today we have this thing we say, just follow me in prayer and you can become a Christian. See, we use that as kind of our marker, our, our thing. Baptism was not, it wasn't supposed to be such a private thing. Someone who commits to Jesus Christ, to commit to God, should publicly be proud and say it. In fact, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, a man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. So there's a, uh, a part of becoming a Christian that is public. Secret Christians are questionable Christians. Secret Christians are questionable Christians. So when he says, repent and be baptized. He's saying, repent, turn from God, believe in your heart, and then be baptized. Publicly proclaim your new life. It says, every one of you, do this in the name of Jesus Christ, and your sins will be forgiven. Your self-centeredness, your path, sins are anything that keep you from focusing on the Lord. Anything that keep you off the path to God. We sin all the time. And so these sins is a, is a collective of anything that keeps me away from God. Repent of that. And you will receive. It's not a second blessing. It's not a, after I become a Christian sometime down the road, road, I pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. No, it is a sealing as Paul says in Galatians, the Holy Spirit seals you, seals your salvation. So as you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes on you and seals your salvation. You have God living in you. You are the new temple of God. You are joined, on, joined with all the other believers in Jesus Christ to become his temple. For it says, you're the, this promise for you, for your children, and for all who are afar off. Everyone, Gentiles, see, this is even before the Gentiles, uh, before Peter reached Cornelius. He says, this is for everyone, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. I'm wondering about you. 
I'm wondering about you. Have you repented of your self-centeredness, of your focus on yourself? The, and the focus of repentance is the direction you go to, not necessarily where you're coming from. Have you repented and you're, 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 with all your might, all your desire, you want to follow Jesus? You, you will follow him off a cliff as long as you get to follow him. Is that your desire? Have you, have you made that known to Jesus? Have you been baptized? If you've become a Christian, baptism is one of those um, sacraments. We call them a sacrament, but it's a sacred practice that we, we practice uh, to declare to the world that I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. How do you know if you've truly repented? Well, the Holy Spirit now dwells in you and lives in you. Will you be doing these miracles and stuff? Most likely not, because that's that was with, at this time, uh, Joel was prophesying at this time when the Holy Spirit came and the church was launched. Now, does visions and wonders and miracles and things happen today? Sure, I believe they do. But their purpose is not the same as this. Um, I think miracles happen every day. And the biggest miracle is when a soul is saved and turned from the darkness of this world to the light of Jesus Christ. Now, if, if you're saying, yes, Lee, I need to repent. I don't know God the way you're talking about. Please send me a message. Send me a message and I'll, I will talk. If, if you're saying, I want to be baptized, you know what? I've turned my life. Uh, I've followed Jesus. He's called me and I want to be baptized now. I haven't been baptized. I want to declare this new life. Please text me. Uh, you can text me or, or Rainier actually and let us know. Well, totally, we want to baptize you. We want to, to follow God in, in this baptism. And if you have any other questions, please use the texting, the chat feature, and, and, and chat with me. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your message, for your word, for, for Peter, and for your Holy Spirit. Um, and I thank you so much for securing our salvation, making us temples of the Holy Spirit, building us up into one great temple of God, the church, those who follow you. Father, I pray for us who are on this line right now, and I pray that our focus is on you. Our focus is to do your will, to encourage others to do your will. Give us this back, the enthusiasm of salvation that some of us may have lost over the years. Give 